Hey, how you doing, everybody? This is a John D. Healy podcast, and John D. Healy is taking a little bit of time off, so I am introducing the next video for you. Today, we're going to be continuing part five of the audiobook, and that's how it all started, by Stoney McGurin. This one features his time in New York City, and some of it is quite the pisser, so you'll really enjoy it. And as always, it's good to talk the John D. Healy podcast, is brought to you by Liffy Van Lines. Remember, if you need help moving, then let Liffy do the lifting. And without further ado, let's continue with, and that's how it all started, the audiobook. I had been driving a cab for six winters, and I was wondering if I would go back on the road again. I had one woman give birth in the cab outside St. Clair's Hospital on 59th and 9th Avenue. There was another pregnant woman I picked up on Columbus Avenue and 102nd Street. I said, St. Clair's, straight down to 59th? Her friend said, No, no, east side, Mount Sinai. I said, The woman is screaming. She won't make it. Yes, she will. Mount Sinai. Her doctor is waiting. I picked up two people, and now I have a screaming baby. Having babies delivered in your cab screws up your whole night and you've just got to go to a bar and explain your problem to the bartender. You need a bucket of water and soap to wash out the back seat and floor and to get the smell out, and even then a customer gets in and says, Hey driver, what's the smell in this cab? I started driving for a different cab company called Carrick. It was owned by Terry Toll and his brother-in-law Frank Early, from County Tyrone. Terry had 80 medallions and Frank had 9. Terry had come to America in 1928 and was lucky. He worked through the Depression. When World War II broke out, all the gasoline went to the war effort. Most of the cab owners went broke and junked their cars. The price of a medallion went down to $10 each. Terry Toll had foresight. He bought 60 taxi medallions and he threw them in a closet. When the war was over and gasoline came back, he went to a bank manager and explained that he had 60 medallions and he wanted to buy 60 new cars and put the medallions on them, and then he'd be in the cab business. The bank manager thought about it for no more than 10 minutes and said it was a sound business deal and gave him $200,000. Terry paid it back in full in five years. His garage was on Northern Boulevard in Queens Plaza. I drove at night. The day driver started at 6 a.m. and I came in at 4 p.m. I would be waiting for him. Then I would leave the off-duty sign-on and drive over the 59th Street Bridge and go up 3rd Avenue to 116th Street. Then I would put the on-duty sign-on. The reason for this was to keep away from the midtown traffic. For a few hours, most Harlem people went to the Bronx. One evening, I was on 3rd Avenue and 122nd Street. This well-dressed man with two shopping bags hailed me. Excuse me, driver, but do you mind going to the Bronx? Sure, I said. He gets in and says... I'll tell you how to go. Thank you. Would you like a cigarette? No, thank you. Are you Irish? Yes, sir. I have a lot of Irish friends. They're all so nice. We get to his building and he says, I have to go up and get money from my wife. I'll leave my bags here until I get back. Okay. I wait 15 minutes. Then I get into the back seat and look in the bags. They're full of empty soda cans, bottles, and old papers. My first con, and he was so nice. My father's words came back to me. Never trust a stranger that's too nice. I said to myself, this won't happen to me again. I was taught to always use common sense, but that doesn't happen all the time. The following weekend, I find myself on Broadway dropping off two people for a show. When they get out, a big heavyset man with a big cowboy hat gets in. I notice his hat looks different. It looks like silk. With a Texas drawl, he says, The Waldorf Hotel. I get there and he says, Wait here, I'm picking up a friend. I say, You can't go. You have to give me what's on the meter. Boy, I don't have any small change. Well, leave your hat, I say. My hat cost more than the front end of this cab. That's when common sense clicked back in. I say, Sorry, sir. Go ahead. A few minutes later, he comes back with a gorgeous young girl about my age on his arm. She says, Baby, how is the oil business in Texas? Fine, baby. Driver, 45th Street and Broadway, please. 
Years later, when I was bartending, I met big company and hotel reps, big guys coming in from out of town. To get their business, they were given the red carpet treatment, free hotel suites, the most expensive call girls, and Broadway tickets. Now I know who my Texas oil man's girl was. I gas up at midnight or whenever I get to Queens. One night, back in Manhattan, going up 1st Avenue at 77th Street, there's a lady in her 40s. When you're in your 20s, 40 is old. She had leather boots up above her knees and the shortest hot pants I ever saw. I stop, and she jumps in the back, says, Go! Go! I went through a red light up 1st Avenue. I ask her, Are you in some kind of trouble? Yes, she says. I'm rich. I live on 5th Avenue, and I can't get a man or boyfriend to go down on me and eat me. I had heard of this. Now I'm wondering. I've got a rich 40- to 50-year-old woman who wants something different. She had been drinking, otherwise she wouldn't be talking like this. Maybe I'll try something new for a change. I knew a guy who owned a bar on 3rd Avenue and 89th Street, who worked there at night. I took her there for a drink. She went to the bathroom. My friend said, Where did you pick up this bimbo? I thought she looked great. She came back from the bathroom and started on both of us. She goes to class places, not dumps. She knows cab owners, not cab drivers. She says, Let's go. Drive me home. We get to 79th Street and 5th Avenue, and she says, You're going down on me. Right. Yes, I say. Okay, she says. You see that door? That's my building. I'll leave the door unlocked. You go around the block and park this thing. I don't want my neighbors seeing me bringing a cab driver in. I park the cab and go back. The door is unlocked. I walk in. There must have been someone there earlier, as there were two half glasses of wine on the table. She was the type who told you what to do. She's standing in the living room, and she tells me to take her clothes off. So I do. She lies down on the couch, puts one leg on the coffee table and the other leg on the back of the couch, and says, Now, eat me. I get down on my knees. It doesn't look very appetizing, and I'm thinking it doesn't have a nice smell. She gets frustrated with me. I say, maybe you go to the bathroom and wash, then I'll be able to go down on you. She goes to the bathroom, but doesn't come out. I open the door, and she's sitting on the bowl, legs spread, half asleep, peeing. She sees me, jumps up out into the living room. Okay, she says. I say, sorry, I can't. I'll go. She says, okay, fuck me then. I did. When it was over, she jumped up and said, Get dressed and get out! She's walking me to the door, and I say, Could I see you again? She says, I need a man to go down on me and eat me out. I can meet guys like you every half hour that will fuck me out! The next day was Sunday. Desmond, Neil Mann, and I go to the Chestnut Bar for an hour before I go to work. I tell them about the rich Fifth Avenue lady I met. Desmond was the type who always wanted to be in charge, and when I finished telling my story, Desmond was shaking his head. I said, what would you do? He said, it's always the wrong guys who get the once-in-a-lifetime break. If I had only met her, I'd be eating my way into a million dollars right now. Months later, I picked up a girl on Lexington Avenue who was pretty drunk. She was wearing a black, full-length fur coat. She said, I want to go to an all-night deli. Back then, there were very few places open all night. Yes, I said, heading straight down to Lexington and 66th Street. We got there, and she got out, took off the coat, and threw it on the back seat and said, That's my coat. Don't go away. I locked the doors, left the meter running, and fell asleep. I woke up 25 minutes later and went into the store. The poor girl was high. She was so friendly that every guy in the store was around her. She had bought so much food, a half pound of this, a half pound of that, that the counter was full of her stuff. I said, do you remember me? No, who are you? I'm your cab driver. You left your black fur coat with me. My, 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 thank you very much. Okay, let me get all this stuff in the cab. She comes out. Can I sit in the front? She says. I say, sure. She says, you know the movie Goldfinger? I said that I did. 
Well, I had a small part in the movie, and Honor Blackman, the girl who played Pussy Galore, gave me that coat. I'd die if I lost it. She lived up on 84th Street, on the east side. When we got there, she said, Would you like to come up to the apartment? Sure, I said. You wait here, she said. Let me bring some of this stuff up. I'll be right back. She comes back and pays me, gives me a big tip for watching her coat, tells me her boyfriend is asleep, that he was supposed to be out of town. Boy, I said to myself, some of those girls could get you killed. I picked up another woman on 59th Street and 8th Avenue. She said, I'm going to 89th and York Avenue. It's by Gracie Mansion. She said she never gets young cab drivers and goes on about how she left her boyfriend. She was going to wake up her friend on 89th Street and stay there, but she was in no hurry getting there. Did I want to stop and have a drink? We were on 1st Avenue between 85th and 86th Streets, near a bar called Mother's. We go in there. It has a big barrel of nuts in the middle of the floor, and everybody is eating out of it. The floor is covered with shells from the nuts. She plays the jukebox and starts dancing. The bartender yells, No dancing! She yells back, Don't be a bore! And just keeps on. The bartender says, You've got to leave! I took her outside and she said, You and I are friends now. I'm riding in the front. I said, Sure. Then I said, I'll drive to 89th Street. When we got there, she said, This is a dead-end street. It's a great place to make out. Drive in here. I love it when a woman tells me what to do. It takes all the guesswork out of it. Back then, all the women wore nylon stockings called pantyhose. She took off her shoes and pulled up her skirt so as not to sit on it. Then she put her two feet up in the air and said, I don't want to put a run in my pantyhose. One week later, I'm driving on 46th Street on Restaurant Row. A lady runs out of Joe Allen's restaurant with her hand up. I stop and she jumps in and says, Wait, my boyfriend will be right out. And it's the same lady. I look at her and she looks at me. I say, do I know you? No, she says. He comes out and says, hello, driver. I say hello, and he gives me an address in the village. We go to the village, and she says, good night, driver, and smiles. I say, good night, and I don't ever expect to see her again. Fifty-four years later, in August of 2017, I'm the owner of Ryan's Daughter, a bar on East 85th Street. My friend John Healy, who promotes artists through shows and book readings and the like, was sponsoring an exhibition at the upstairs bar. He had put out a few pages of this book before it was published for people to look at, and he asked a lady friend of his to read them and tell him what she thought. He says to me, she really wants to meet you. So I go to meet her, this well-dressed little old lady. She shakes my hand and tells me her name is Laura. I want to tell you something, she says. I never forget anything, even when I've been drinking. The story you have in your book about the girl you made out with at Gracie Mansion in 1963? Well, that was me. I was taken aback when I realized that you were the same taxi driver that my boyfriend and I hailed outside of Alan's restaurant a week later. That was very nice of you to say, do I know you? We had a hug and a laugh and talked about our younger days. That something like this can happen to me in a city of nine million people, I find it so hard to believe. Small world. The joys of driving. I was half parked on 45th Street and 8th Avenue at 3 a.m. when two guys got in the back seat, one tall and one short. The tall guy grabbed my head and stuck a gun in my neck with his other hand. The money, man! I said, it's in my breast pocket. The little guy got my money and said, there's more, where's the rest? I said, that's it. The little guy said, these guys are smart, they hide it in their shoes. He jumped into the front seat and went for my sock. That was where I did have my money. I was scared now because I had lied. I had my hand on the handle of the door, and as he went for my sock, I came up with my right knee and hit him in the chin. Then I yanked the door open and dove down to get away from the gun and out onto the street. But because I was parked away from the curb, my left side landed between the curb and the street, and I was hurting. I got up to see them run up 8th Avenue. I drove to the garage and checked in. They drove me to Elmhurst Hospital. They told me I had three fractured ribs. All they do with fractured ribs is wrap you up from your chest down to your stomach and let them heal. 
Boy, did it hurt when you coughed or sneezed. I was back driving in Harlem, and one night at about 11 p.m., I picked up an old black man on 116th Street and 5th Avenue. He said, 147th Street off Morningside Avenue. Then he looked and saw that I was white, and he said, What are you doing up here, white boy? I said, Just trying to make a living like everybody else. He said, It's a poor living when you're dead. He said, I was going into my house one night, and there were five young punks sitting on the stoop. They stuck a gun in my ear and said, We need it all, Pop. One of them said, What does an old black man need money for anyway? I told them, Take everything, just don't pull the trigger. He said to me, Now look, son, when you get me to my house, I'll pay you while I'm in the cab. Then I'll get out, but you don't leave. My wife and I have two German shepherds. We live on the fifth floor. I have a whistle here, and when I blow it, she'll let the dogs out, and they'll come down to take me home. We got up there, and there were five young guys sitting on the stoop. He said, Look, there they are. He paid me and got out. I opened the passenger window so that he could talk to me. He blew the window, and as fast as you could count, one, two, three, four, five, two German shepherds came flying through the door. He said to me, You do what I told you. Lock your doors and get out of Harlem. He yelled to the dogs and they started barking. He yelled to the guys, Move or the dogs will move you. They jumped up and the old man went home. I started thinking, in the United States of America, there must be 60% of people who live in their own little world, shouting from the hilltop, Freedom for all! The white guys want to kill me because I was with a black man, an old black man needs dogs to get into his own house because of black kids, and he ain't doing too well with the whites either. I would love to sit down with that old black man and get his version of the American dream. Change my plans. April came and I was thinking of going back on the road trucking. I was in the Bliss Tavern on 46th Street off of Queens Boulevard in Woodside, Queens, and the bartender said his friend, Matty, was quitting his bartender job at a place called La Salle. When I asked why, he said there were two reasons. One, there were too many fights. And two, he preferred being a waiter. As a waiter, you worked lunch, then you took three hours off, went shopping, came back and did supper. With bartending, it was ten hours plus travel time. I said that I would take that job. He gave me the address of the bar. The next night, I stopped in to see Matty. I introduced myself and told him that I knew his friend, Vinny. He told me he was going to quit, but his boss, Jack Beckett, gave him a raise in salary, and he decided to stay with it for a while. I asked him where he lived, and he told me Sunnyside, Queens. I asked him how he got home, and he said by cab. I told him that the cab company I drove for was located near there. Can I make you my last fare? He said, I'd love that, as I'm nervous hailing a cab in this neighborhood at 5 a.m., Okay, I said. I'll be here at 4.30 or 5 every morning. I stopped by the next morning at 4 a.m. to see if he had any customers. I was surprised to find the place full. He introduced me to a few local guys, Jackie, Sully, Dennis Cooney, and George Kelly. All tough guys, and there were more to come. Over the next three weeks, I got to know quite a few of them. I was happy now that they were familiar with me. One night, I was in Harlem. I was running late and had no time to pick Maddie up. At 5 a.m., there was nobody on the streets and no traffic, so I decided to go back to the garage. I was coming across 116th Street, headed towards Lexington Avenue, with green lights all the way to 2nd Avenue, and I was doing 60. A bus had just pulled in, and a guy jumped off the bus and ran right across in front of me. I caught him dead center on the hood of my cab, and I put my two feet on the brakes. He went flying up the hood and up the windshield, and when the car stopped, he went flying back down the windshield and down the hood to the street. All this happened in seconds. I jumped out, and by the time I was out, he was up. I said, you need an ambulance? He started running towards Park Avenue, yelling back at me, Fuck you! Fuck you, you motherfucking! The light had changed red, so the bus couldn't leave, so I went over to the bus driver. He opened a small window and bent his head down. I said to him, Did you see that? And with an Irish accent, he said, I didn't see nothing. The light was green, and he drove away. There was an old Spanish man standing on the sidewalk. As I was getting back into the cab to drive away, he said, 
You can't leave, I've got your license plate. I got scared, and when I saw a cop car coming down Lexington Avenue, I waved it down and told the cops the whole story. They said to me, It's okay, you told us, you can go. And they drove away. After they left, I had second thoughts, and I drove to the precinct on 119th Street. I walked in and there was a cop behind the desk, and a sergeant standing outside the desk. I told him my story. The sergeant said to me, Did you get their shield numbers? No. Did you get their car number? No. How dumb can you be? He turned to the guy behind the desk. Who do you think would be driving over there? He said, Don't know, Sarge. The sergeant turned to me and said, Give me a license and registration, and he typed up a full report. Afterward, he said, Always take a cop's shield number. When they don't take a written report from you, you could get into big trouble. I said, Thank you very much, sir. I'll remember this. I stopped by the bar the next night, and the place was a wreck. Oh, Stony, Maddie said. I can't take this. There's no amount of money that could keep me here. I'll introduce you to Jack tomorrow evening. I told him all about you, how you were in refrigeration, truck driving, and cab driving. I met Jack the following evening. He came out from behind the bar after his day shift and sat down with a beer, and I was introduced to him. He said, I understand you were in refrigeration, and then a truck driver and a cab driver. So, are you going to use me also? I sized him up, and I figured that he was the type of man who wasn't into being called sir. I said, Well, Jack, I did all those jobs, plus I did a little bartending on weekends in the Red Mill and in the Ferguson and McLaughlin, and I liked bartending. I think it's time for me to settle into a full-time job, and if you give me a chance, I will prove myself. He said, I know Ferguson and McLaughlin. There's a big sign over the register. What does it say? I said, It reads, If you want your prayers answered, get off your knees and work. Jack liked me, and I was hired. So I call the cab company and tell them that I have a new job. Everything is going great with Jack until he asks me one morning to go into the kitchen and cook bacon, sausage, and scrambled eggs. I learned early in life that nobody can cook scrambled eggs and sausage without another person complaining. You should have cooked it more. You cooked it too much. The eggs are too soft. The eggs are too hard. Jack, I said, I never cooked in my life. I even order in toast. Okay, he said. I understand some guys do not like to cook, even for themselves. A Day at the Races Jack had me work with him for two weeks before he decided he was going to keep me and put me working the night shift. On his day off, he always went to the races. He asked me if I ever went to the races, and I told him no. He said he was going to Aqueduct the next day, and that he would meet me, and that I would enjoy it. It's not my favorite racetrack, he said, but it will do. Monmouth Racetrack is my favorite. I lived in Richmond Hill, close to the track, so I met him there. I didn't know how much money Jack brought with him to the track, but he won quite a few races and bragged to me that they knew him at the $100 window, and they did. At the eighth race, he put $6,800 on a horse to win. That year, you could buy a cab and medallion for $8,000. Jack used to watch the races on the screen with one hand in his pocket and no emotion on his face. Me, on the other hand, my heart was in my mouth, and it wasn't even my money. The race was a photo finish, and we had to wait. It seemed like a long time, but it finally came up. He had lost. Keep in mind that five minutes before the race, Jack could have bought a cab. Without even flinching, he turned to me, tucked in his tie, and said, Stoney, give me twenty bucks. I'm taking a cab out of here. Jack always liked to show off. The next evening, when I got behind the bar, he gave me my twenty, and as he did, an envelope fell to the floor. Pick that up, he said. See what's in it. And him knowing what was in it. It was a check for $59,000 from the Navy. Later on that night, his good friend, John Flaherty, who lived around the corner, came in. He was a police lieutenant on the short list for captain, but because of his age, the department rushed his papers through and made him retire so they wouldn't have to pay him a captain's pension. I told Flaherty about the $59,000 check. Yes, he said. Jack got that from the Navy. Flaherty said... Let me tell you about Jack. And he told me. Jack's wife had two brothers, one in Ireland and one here. 
Jack had this dream of going back to Ireland to live on a farm. Every year, he and his wife went back to the Galway races. One year, he met up with his brother-in-law, who knew of a farm for sale. He looked at it, liked it, and said that he'd buy it. He wasn't going to move to Ireland for another ten years. At that time, the taxes were high if you lived outside of Ireland but owned land in it. So the brother-in-law, McHugh, said, Put it in my name for the ten years. And so he did. Jack paid for it in cash. Jack and the wife went over every year for the Galway races and would go admire his farm. When the ten years were up, Jack and the wife packed up and went back to Ireland to live on their farm. Bombshell, McHugh, said, It is in my name, and I feel that it's mine, so it's mine. Jack told his wife, You can stay here too, and he returned to New York. He was thirty-five years old. The Second World War was on and the government was looking for men, so he went to the Navy recruiting office and signed up for five years. That's where that check came from. When he came out of the Navy, he bumped into the other brother-in-law who lived up on 190th Street in Washington Heights. Jack held no grudges. He was looking for an apartment. McHugh knew of one in his apartment building, one floor above him, on the fifth floor, and Jack took it. It was a large building. When you walked into the big lobby, the left side of the building, the side that Jack lived on, was a walk-up. The right side of the building had an elevator. Jack would take the elevator to the roof and walk down one flight. Jack got a job as a salesman selling glasses to bars and restaurants. Working on commission, he was an expert salesman. McHugh owned a bar, and he told Jack that he would make him a 25% partner for $5,000. Back then, you could buy a bar for $5,000, but Jack went for it. McHugh and Jack both could waste money. The bar went bust, and Jack was out of business again. Jack never did go back to Ireland. He started working as a bartender in high-class places, but he always liked bartending in rough, middle-class places. It was interesting because Jack was highly educated, five years of college, and he had no problem cutting you down to size with some $50 words. He met a man, Donahue, who had five bars and restaurants, who asked him to become a partner in one of his bars in Harlem, at Amsterdam Avenue and LaSalle Street at 125th Street. Jack went for it again. The contract was that Jack had to work five days a week for a 49% partnership with an inventory and split of the profit every three months. Two years after he started working for Donahue, the city decided to put in housing projects on Amsterdam Avenue, from 122nd Street to 125th Street. Donahue found an empty storefront on Amsterdam Avenue at 90th Street. He and Jack remained partners, and they brought the LaSalle name with them. Jack settled in and found himself a girlfriend who had a husband. According to gossip, she wasn't the brightest. Jack's brother-in-law, McHugh, still lived in the building on the fourth floor underneath Jack. He got married and started having kids. When Jack and he met, they tolerated each other. Flaherty said, Fourteen years had passed. I went into the bar one night. Jack brought me into the kitchen and handed me a letter and said, Read this. The letter was from Jack's wife, telling him she was coming back the next month. Jack asked me what he should do. I said, The first thing you do is get rid of that bimbo. The second thing you do is fix up your apartment. She is your wife. He never went to Ireland while his wife lived there. She came back to New York in June. He was at the Galway races in July, and he never missed them ever again. But he never took her. I guess it was his way of getting even. The brother-in-law and his wife still lived underneath Jack when she died from complications giving birth to her fifth baby. Since Jack and the wife had no kids, she took the place of her brother's wife. The oldest kid was eight years old. Things started to run smoothly after a few months. One year later, her brother had a heart attack and died. Jack told his wife, Let's keep all these kids together. It would be like a duplex apartment. You be the mother and I'll pay and we will put all of them through school as far as they want to go. When I started working for Jack, one of the kids was then 17. Jack had him cleaning and mopping and packing out beer, just like he had me do when he hired me. The kid would say to me, I, I hate Uncle Jack. Because I knew the story, I let the kid know how foolish he sounded and how he and his brothers and sisters could have ended up in foster homes. He said, yes, but I still hate him. 
Kids do not appreciate things until they are much older. Cops and Robbers Flaherty was pushed into retiring before he became a captain. He would go to the track with Jack and Ernie. Ernie was married to Jack's partner, Donahue's daughter. He owned and operated the garage one block away on 89th Street. Flaherty told me that when he had been a lieutenant on patrol in Midtown, he had finished his 4 p.m. to midnight shift and walked home. Back then, Jack worked nights. It was 2 a.m. He stopped in to see Jack, and he was down at the end of the bar talking to a customer. Two other customers were arguing, and Jack got annoyed. He yelled at them to stop. A customer asked for a whiskey. As Jack grabbed the bottle, it slipped out of his hand and hit Flaherty smack in his face and forehead. Blood was everywhere. Everybody wanted to call the cops and an ambulance. He was the only one who kept a cool head. He said, no, nobody call nobody. They wrapped his head in towels. He told Jack to call Ernie, and when he arrived, he said, here's what you do, Ernie. Take your car out of the garage. Bring it to Amsterdam and 89th Street and park it as if you were turning onto the avenue. I want you to know that I'm going to pay for all of this. Then we break the windshield. I'll break it the rest of the way with my head to get my blood on the glass. Then I'll lie in the front seat as a passenger and you call an ambulance. I won't talk. You'll do the talking. Tell them a car went through the light and you hit the brakes and I went through the windshield. They kept it as low-key as possible, but when the top brass got a whiff of it, they were all over it. I asked Flaherty why he would go to so much trouble. He said that the Internal Affairs Division, the IAD, was always looking for something. They would have it make the front page of the newspaper. The headline would read, Police Lieutenant in Barroom Brawl at 2 a.m. Got 40 stitches. I could never tell the true story to anybody I worked with. He said to me, You know, we had a poem back home about a secret. I said, Hold it, I bet I know it. If you have a friend, just keep him so. Never let that friend your secret know. For if that friend should turn your foe, then all the world your secrets will know. Now that he was retired, on quiet nights he would tell stories. I liked most of them, but there was one that I didn't like. When he was a cop on the beat, he once pulled the car over. He noticed the guy's glasses on the dashboard. He asked the guy for his license and registration. His license said he wore glasses to drive. Flaherty gave him a ticket for having no license, which I really didn't like. He went to court on his court date, and the guy was present. When the guy was called, the guy produced his license. The judge said, dismissed. Flaherty stood up and said, Excuse me, Your Honor, I'm the police officer who wrote that ticket. The judge said, Okay, officer, explain to me why you think this man didn't have a license. This happened back in the late 1930s, Flaherty said. So I said to the judge, Your Honor, there, there are three states in the United States that do not require a license to drive a car. This gentleman has a license, but he must be wearing glasses when he drives. He was not wearing his glasses, therefore he has no license. The judge agreed. Flaherty was so proud of himself. I was not. He was extremely smart. He had a photographic memory, and he was very well known and liked in the department. The captains, lieutenants, and sergeants from the 20th and 24th precincts used to stop by at night to talk to him about cases that they had going on. From listening to them talk, you'd know that there's a big book on law on the desk in every precinct. They would ask Flaherty a question about their cases, and he would stand up and say, You will find it on page 1020, and then he would recite it as if he were reading it out of the book. Flaherty came to New York to 9th Avenue and 17th Street in the winter of 1923, a very cold winter. All the houses were cold water flats with bare wood floors. You needed a lot of blankets to keep warm. The first morning he got out of bed in his bare feet, he stood up and he couldn't move. He looked down at his feet and they were stuck to the floor. He hadn't known yet that winters in New York were so cold that you went to bed with your socks on so your feet wouldn't stick to the floor when you got out of bed in the morning. He had wanted to become a cop, but he was racing against the clock. You had to be in the country for five years to become a citizen, and you had to be a citizen to be a cop. He had to go to night school and get his high school diploma, and then take the cop test, all before his 29th birthday. If you passed before your 29th birthday, you were on the list. He passed 
but he didn't get called until he was 33, and that was too old to become a cop. He was sent to the Bronx, where his beat was the Grand Concourse in Fordham Road. He said that back then, there were no cops in cars. Sergeants and lieutenants were the only ones with cars. The sergeant made the rounds every two hours, and you'd better be out there when he came around or you would get a complaint. One snowy night at 3 a.m., he was standing in a doorway on 188th Street when the car came around and stopped. The sergeant opened the window. Flaherty gave him his book. The sergeant signed it and drove away. Flaherty said to himself he'd better start studying harder and get that guy's job. Two years later, he was transferred to Manhattan. He kept studying, and the next year, the sergeant's test came up. He took it and passed. His new assignment was back in the Bronx, where he had been a beat cop. The winter came and the snow came. One night, he was going up the concourse at 3 a.m., and he thought of himself standing in the doorway, freezing while waiting for the sergeant. He said to the driver, Turn here. And there was a cop standing in that same doorway. He rolled down the window and signed his book. As the cop walked away, Flaherty said, The same to you. His driver asked him what that was about. Oh, he said. Three years ago, I was standing in that doorway freezing, and when the sergeant signed my book, I said, Fuck you, under my breath. I knew what he was saying to me, so I was just answering him, The same to you. Flaherty told me, As a sergeant, I learned the ropes. You pay for nothing while you're in uniform. The local bookies were the best at paying us off. The mayor brought in a new commissioner, Murphy, to stop the cops who were on the take. I got transferred to Harlem, 28th Precinct. I found it hard to believe there were no racial problems in the 28th Precinct. There wasn't one white person living in it when I was sergeant. My first night there, I got in the patrol car, and I can tell the cop is nervous as he drives up the street. I say, where is the action? He says, what? What? I said, never mind this Murphy guy, where's the action? He said, maybe down this block. And he pulled down into the middle of the block and stopped. This guy runs over, saying, hi, man. The man throws a bag over my shoulder into the back seat and we drive away. Thank you, bookie. On a Sunday in the 28th Precinct, as a sergeant, he'd get $360 and give $10 to the cop driver. I told him if I was the cop, I would consider $10 an insult, that I should get at least 100 or he could just put me back out on the beat. Flaherty said, I did a lot of walking. The old black men shining shoes on 125th Street had a spare shoe box, and it wasn't full of polish. It was full of miniature vodka and whiskey bottles, like you get on an airplane. He gave me two bucks. I went down some steps to a basement. That guy had bars on the window wide enough to let a bottle through. He didn't see the uniform as he was coming with a bottle in his hand. I told him I'm not here for the whiskey. Then he sees the uniform. He says, Okay, man, and gives me ten dollars. The following year, the sergeants and lieutenants called for a meeting. I noticed a lot of Jewish names. The meeting was about changing the structure of how the money was collected. They wanted to pool the money and split it every month. I knew their game immediately. Come the Sunday, when they had to make the rounds, they would call in sick, but they would be there at the end of the month to collect. I stood up and said, What you walk for, you keep. What I walk for, I keep. Five years later, I made lieutenant. Now I'm part of the top brass. They would bring lieutenants from the high crime precincts to one police plaza for round-the-table talks to discuss how to handle situations. I explained to them how it worked in Harlem. Gentlemen, conversation around this table flows like buttermilk. But uptown, where 80% of the people use the word motherfucker, and you get a call to a bar with trouble and the walls are actually moving with an angry crowd at 3 in the morning... The only way you get their attention is to fire two shots in the ceiling and yell, Back up, motherfucker! That way you may get out alive. Flaherty would never tell young cops how times were, because a cop named Frank Serpico completely brought down the corruption in the police department. But he liked to talk to old-timers. I recall a retired sergeant from Brooklyn asking him how it was as a lieutenant in the Midtown area known as the Tenderloin. 
He said being a lieutenant on patrol in Midtown was like being nominated for vice president of the United States. You went to work tired, hungry, and broke, and you came home well-rested, well-fed, and, if the dice rolled right, with a pocket full of money. He said the interesting thing was that all the top brass were cops at one time, so when a cop got a complaint, they would transfer him to Central Park where he could make no money. Nothing in Central Park but rabbits. Central Park had an upside. There were more sergeants and lieutenants made out of the Central Park precinct than any other precinct in the city. Rabbits don't need policing. The smart cops took their books to work. Flaherty said, When I became a lieutenant in Midtown, I worked at the desk. There were 2,000 arrests a year. You had one hand on the phone full time, and the other hand was writing in arrests. If you didn't know the big law book on the desk off by heart, you had problems. The interesting thing about Times Square was it had a lot of hustlers. They worked their craft very well. They weren't out to hurt you, just to get everything you had. The smartest thing in a hustler's brain is picking the right person. I walked to work every day through Times Square, wearing civilian clothes, and nobody approached me. Now, here's a phone call we get often. Here's one of the stories. A young guy, five feet two inches tall, just out of college, first day in New York. His parents have given him a thousand dollars. He's walking down Broadway. The hustler approaches him with pictures of girls, white, Asian, black. Ha, huh, man, you look like a nice guy. You want a girl? Shows him the pictures, then says, you're not a cop, are you? Back then, you had to be 5'8 to be a cop. Instead of this guy catching on, his ego takes over. No, I'm not a cop. The hustler shows the pictures again. Which one do you like? The Asian? Okay, she will be $10 for you. She is young, but old enough to screw. That okay? Yes, says the kid. Okay, the hustler says. Come with me a few blocks. He says, Man, I'm so glad I met you. You're going to have the time of your life. They get to a brownstone, a five-story walk-up. They go inside. The hustler says, You wait here until I make sure the girls are ready. He disappears for five minutes, then comes back with another guy. The other guy is angry, yelling at his buddy. Why do you pick those guys up? What if he's a cop? The kid can't wait to tell them, No, no, I'm not a cop. Okay, we believe you, the hustler says. Here's the way it is. We have had trouble with our girls. Some of them are not honest. He pulls out a large brown envelope and says, This is for your protection. Put everything you have in here and we'll seal it in front of you. The college kid puts his thousand dollars, his watch, even his change in the envelope, and they seal it in front of him. The guys tell him, Wait ten minutes and ring apartment 5E. They go to the roof and go over two buildings, and they're gone. Flaherty said, I often wondered why they used not just the same building, but the same apartment. The phone call comes in. I answer, this is the police department. This is Mrs. Murphy calling. They're banging on my door again. I recall a young cop telling him that he bought a house out on the island. Flaherty said, Tell your neighbors you are anything but a cop because in the suburbs they think cops are lawyers. They don't realize that 90% of us were lucky to pass the test for a high school diploma. The cop says, what should I tell them? Before I give Flaherty's answer, I must explain what a longshoreman is. A longshoreman works on ships and docks. That's all he knows is ships. So when the young cop said to Flaherty, what should I tell them? Flaherty said, tell them you're a longshoreman and hope there's not a big flood and a ship sailing up the block at two o'clock in the morning. On a snowy January night, a guy came into the LaSalle at 1 a.m., made his way to the end of the bar, and started talking to Flaherty. Flaherty had a way of putting people at ease. Keep in mind, it is 15 degrees outside. The guy tells Flaherty that he sells Swiss watches, Swiss army knives, etc. Does Flaherty want one? Flaherty asks to look at one. The guy had on a big, heavy overcoat, which he opened. Flaherty shouts to me, and I look down the bar. All I could see was watches and Swiss Army knives on both sides of his coat. There must have been at least a hundred, and that's all he had on. Not a stitch of clothing except underpants. 
I fell down on the floor with laughter. Flaherty tells him he had better close his coat, and he did. He figured Flaherty to be a cop, so he says to Flaherty, I have a permit for a gun. Flaherty says, Do you have it on you? Sure, he said. Let me show you. Flaherty takes it into the kitchen where there was good light. He shouts to me, Stoney, I know you're busy, but you gotta see this. So I go into the kitchen and he reads it off. Can't believe it. It is an up-to-date gun permit. He takes it back out and says to the guy, You're right. It is an up-to-date permit. You know, he says to the guy, I don't mind you having this gun permit, but it's the guy who issued you this permit that I like to meet. After working three years in the La Salle, I bought a car. There were two old guys, Chuck and Hank, who would wait for me to drive them home. Flaherty would go home at one or two in the morning. He liked to go to the track during the daytime. One night he left early, but he was back in half an hour. He says to me, Call the cops, I got mugged. He had got off two rounds, but as a cop, you can't let off rounds and not report it in case one round went through a window and hit somebody. When the police car came, he explains the situation and they took him to the station house. I remembered him telling me when you work the desk, you do it by the book. You always cover yourself. When he went to the precinct, the young cop behind the desk asked him for his permit. Flaherty was shocked. His gun permit was out of date. He says, I'll go down tomorrow and get it renewed. The young cop says, I'll have to take your gun. Flaherty says, This gun wasn't out of my hand in 34 years. Can't you overlook it this time? No, Mr. Flaherty, I cannot. You know the rules better than anybody. Now hand me your gun. He tells me that young prick took his gun. Well, Flaherty, I say, you could have overlooked the poor bastard that had his glasses on the dashboard. What goes around comes around. Every night after that, he asks Hank to walk him home. I say, Look here, Flaherty, you got some nerve. Your apartment is only a block and a half away. Poor old Hank, he has to walk back here. He says, But he doesn't have to worry about a gun and making out a report. No, I said, But he has to worry about his life. He stays here, him and Chuck and I drive them home, so they won't get mugged, and you're putting Hank's life at risk, and you have a gun. After that, he stayed until I closed, and I drove them all home. I liked it better that way, because he had no problem using the gun when there was a stick-up. Flaherty was in very good shape at age 69. He was always talking about not drinking. Because he had a drinking problem, once he started, he couldn't stop until he got help. He always dressed in a suit and tie, but the one time I saw him drunk, it was sad. I had been on vacation. I drove into work on a rainy Monday evening. As I pull into a parking spot, I see Flaherty coming down the street in the rain with no shoes. Because his socks are wet, they're half off his feet and coming off more with every step he takes. The socks flip back and forth. I say, Hey, Flaherty, what happened to you? He lifts his head, gives me the long look, trying to figure out who I am. It took him a couple of seconds. Oh, Stoney, I need your help. I say, Do you have the gun on you? Yes. Can I have it? Yeah. I get the gun and put it in the trunk of the car, and he comes with me back into the LaSalle where Jack is working. Jack says, he wouldn't listen to us all week. I say, he knows he's got to stop or he's going to die. Jack says, I'll work late tonight for you. See what you can do. So I called Dan McRory and Paul McMorrow. McRory was a cop in emergency service, and Matt had just joined the FBI. Flaherty knew them and their fathers and mothers. When they arrived, McRory says, John, we'll take you to the hospital. He says, No, you're not taking me to no shithole. I'm going to Long Island. He fumbles for his wallet. I got a card in here. The police department has a place on Long Island where they send cops to dry out. Okay, I say. Let's go to the car. McRory asks where his gun is, and I tell him that Flaherty gave it to me, and I'll give it to you. The last thing I need is to be pulled over with a police lieutenant's gun in the car. 
We drive him to Long Island and bring him into the front desk, and he's in bad shape. There's a young girl there, 18 or 19. You could tell the job was new to her. She said, I have to ask you some questions, Mr. Flaherty. Are you allergic to anything? Yes, he says. I'm allergic to bullshit. He was back out in three weeks and back to his old self. Shined shoes, suit, and tie, stopping in to see Jack at lunch hour on his way to the track, where he would always put on a bet for Jack. I go into work one evening and Flaherty has a great story for me. He tells me that, Because of all the construction going on across the street, I came in here at 12 noon. This place was full with construction guys. I look down the bar and see an undercover cop who's in the gambling squad. I see another guy at the phone and another guy at the door. I sneak out down to Broadway so I can call Jack and tell him he's been raided. Then I have second thoughts. If I call Jack, he'll probably tell the guy with a hard hat to be careful, who I thought, by the way. I decided to go back and make like I walked in to use the bathroom. You need to do it fast. Don't give the guy a chance to say anything. So I walk down the bar fast, spot the undercover, and say, Hey, how you doing? Nice to see you in the neighborhood. Let me introduce you to my friend Jack. Well, he says, that's not what I came up here for. Then he called the guy off from the phone, and he called the guy off from the door, and he had two more guys outside. They would have taken Jack like Sherman took Richmond. I asked him why he was up here. He said an Irish woman called and said the bartender was running prostitution and gambling, and we were sent up to close it down. There was an old Jewish man, Sam, who took some bets. If Sam had been there and took a bet over the phone, Jack would have been closed down for three weeks. Jack's partner had a son in the police. They decided to have a gold shield made for Flaherty, and when they presented him with it, he was highly insulted. He tells me, I saved them from being shut down with a mark on their license, and they gave me a gold shield? I got a drawer full of that shit. Flaherty, Hank, and Chuck used to wait for me every night. While I was ringing off and packing away the beer, Flaherty used to run from the kitchen to the front door and then back. Then, with a closed fist, he would hit his chest and say, I'm in great shape, but I have this pain in my chest. It's not bad, but it's there. Then, he stopped coming in. We thought it was because of the gold shield. Two weeks went by. One day, a detective, Mike Sheehan, came in. He knew everybody, so Jack asked him to check on Flaherty. He comes back in two days and tells us, I found him. He's in the St. Clair Hospital morgue. His toe was tagged. I got there just in time. Tomorrow, he was going to a potter's field. Mike Sheehan said what happened was that Flaherty checked himself into the hospital. When they asked him his next of kin, instead of their son who lives out on the island, he gave his own address. The mail kept coming and the building super kept putting it under his door. I must say I enjoyed him, and I miss him. Chuck and Other LaSalle Characters now I must tell you about Chuck. Chuck was a small, skinny man. As a young man, he worked at the coal mines in Pennsylvania and he got black lung. When I met him, he was breathing bad, and he drank Shenley whiskey and ginger every day. He would be in the LaSalle every day when I got in until I drove him home. He drank very slow. He never got drunk. One night I went in to use the bathroom. Chuck was in there after taking a leak, and he was grunting and moaning because of his lungs, and he can't get his penis in his pants because it's so big. I said, I'll leave you to it. You'll make it. The next day I said to Jack, Do you know Chuck is deformed? He knew right away and laughed. He said that 25 years ago, Chuck was the James Bond around here. One girl told the next girl, and they all had to have him. When I drove Flaherty, Hank, and Chuck home, I made Chuck the last to drop off. I asked him how old he was when he started having sex. He said he was 12. I asked, with all the 12 and 13-year-old girls? Yes, he said, plus my teacher. She was 21 years old, and one day she asked me to stay late, and she took me into the coal shed. After that, she took me in twice a week. I said, in a lot of cases, young guys like to brag, but you never told anybody? Never, he said. In my day, you never talked. 
A good thing was a good thing, and I was smart enough to know she would lose her job and I might go to a reformatory school. Back in Pennsylvania, when I was a kid, you were taught to think like a smart old man, not a young dumb one. Working in the coal mines as a young man took its toll on his lungs. He had a small oxygen tank in his pocket and he walked very slow. He came from the doctor one day and showed us the papers. He only had eight months to live. Let me explain that back then, every bar in New York at Christmas time gave the good customers a bottle of whatever it was they drank. Chuck drank Shenley whiskey, but because Jack knew Chuck is dying, he didn't give him a bottle. I thought it was very mean, but Chuck took it in good spirits. He said to Jack, I know why, because I may be gone. But poor Chuck didn't die, and next Christmas comes and Jack gives him a bottle. At 5 a.m. Christmas morning, I drive Chuck home to his cheap hotel called Hayton Hall. It had a doorman, but he was asleep half the time. I see Chuck to the elevator as usual. The next night I go into work, and there is Chuck at the end of the bar. Somebody says he got mugged last night. I asked him how that could happen. He told me that when he got off the elevator, two black guys were waiting for him. They took him into his room. One sat on him so he couldn't breathe, and the other ransacked the room and left. Well, I said to him, at least Jack gave you a bottle this Christmas so you could have a drink because you needed one. But he said they took that too. Then there were the Henderson sisters. Betty was a beauty. I was working there about a month when I met them. Flaherty was there, and they came right down the bar to talk to him and stayed a few hours and then left. Flaherty says, That woman that just left, Betty Henderson. One night you'll have to put her out, and when you do, she'll piss on you. She wears no panties, and it will flow out of her. Four to six weeks later, Betty came in on her own. She sat beside a guy in the middle of the bar. He's buying her drinks, and Flaherty brings it to my attention. Check out what's going on with Betty and her new friend. I walk around the bar, and Betty has her shawl thrown over his lap. She has his penis out, and she's fondling his balls. I ask him and Betty to leave. He does. Betty says, I ain't leaving. I say, yes, you are. Says, don't put your hands on me or I'll piss on you. I can't believe she's telling me this. I grab her and I only get to the door before she spreads her legs. Holy mackerel, it came out of her like the young mares back on the farm. I got her out and mopped the floor. Flaherty said, You were warned. Then there was Harriet. She came from Wisconsin. She was in her fifties but looked older. You could tell she had been good looking. I was told that she was Jack's girlfriend for a time. She told me her first husband was a salesman. They lived in a small apartment with a Murphy bed. One night, she's in bed with a boyfriend, and she hears the door opening. She jumps up, flips the bed into the wall with the boyfriend in it, throws a nightgown on, and meets her husband at the door. Oh, honey, I was going out for cigarettes and milk. Would you be a doll? Off he goes. She runs to the Murphy bed and pulls it down. The boyfriend's almost out of breath. Come on, get dressed and get out. She runs to the fridge, pours the milk down the sink, hides the cigarettes, sits down, and waits for hubby. That was too close for comfort. She met a Jewish guy who took her to Florida. They had an argument. He broke her teeth, and she went downhill from there. She would come into the LaSalle, and people would always buy her drinks. She liked to play the jukebox. Jack didn't want nobody playing the jukebox when the races were on or when the Kennedys were on, but he would never unplug it. Once, she plays the jukebox. Jack gets mad, comes out and unplugs it, and then plugs it back in. Goes back behind the bar. Harriet plays it again. Jack, her ex-boyfriend, comes out from behind the bar and pushes her out the door. Very cold outside. He goes back behind the bar and he looks to the door. There's Harriet, back in, standing by the radiator with her skirt up above her waist. Jack says very loud, What are you doing now? Harriet says, I'm warming your lunch. Losing her teeth sent Harriet into a tailspin. What a bastard that did that. And she was a beautiful, fine-looking woman. She went downhill fast after that. She got sick and started walking slow, like she had nothing to live for. 
There was a supermarket at 90th Street on Broadway. I was coming into work one evening, down Broadway, and I see this tractor trailer backing up. I'm watching him because I used to drive a tractor trailer. Harriet is coming across the street behind the trailer. He gets a glimpse of her in the mirror and he gets a shock. He jumps out, comes running, screaming at her. I could have killed you, lady! Harriet acted like she didn't hear him until she got one foot on the sidewalk, then turned real slow, looked at him straight in the face and said, You'd have done me a fucking favor. Harriet must have told the family lies back in Wisconsin about New York City being where the money was because when she died, she had nieces and nephews and a sister who came to New York wanting to know who stole her money. In the end, they did a nice thing and they brought her back to Wisconsin. It made me feel very happy. Harriet was a funny lady and had a heart of gold. R.I.P. Bryant's Brothel Lee Bryant lived upstairs in the same building as the LaSalle. She would tell us all that she had no education. She was a very tough lady. She ran a brothel, using young girls, out-of-state students, trying to pay their way through college, most times having them work out of their own apartments. She had a young black man, Lloyd, helping her run the business. He was a gentleman. He was a big man who always wore a suit and talked softly. Lee often took in black runaways and had them do robberies for her. Bruce and Jason were two guys that she had for a while. There was another friend of hers, a guy who had a good job at Madison Square Garden, named Cecil. He was friends with both Lee and Lloyd, and he took Bruce under his wing. They would hang out in the LaSalle together, and he would buy soda for Bruce and advise him to try and get away from Lee. Since I was there, behind the bar, he would include me in the conversation and ask me my opinion. I became close to both of them. One night, Lee was drinking with some people from the building. She bought a round of drinks for the group with a traveler's check. The round was $25, but the check was stolen and it bounced. A few days later, I meet her and tell her she owes the $25 she did not pay, and she did not care. I told her I would not serve her until she paid. I kept that bounced check. She was mostly a day customer of Jack's, and he would serve her. Another night, I am behind the bar, and the building superintendent is drinking by the door. She comes in and starts to argue with him, and gets loud, using bad language. I say, Lee, keep it down. She yells at me and says, What? Are you eavesdropping on me, you white Irish blue-eyed motherfucker? She finally left. Two months go by and I come in for my evening shift, and there she is with a group of her friends, and they are buying the rounds. It's 7 o'clock p.m., and she must have thought I had forgotten about the check and felt guilty for drinking for free off her friends. She says to me, Let's forget the past. I want to buy my friends a drink. And she puts up a $50 bill. I give her friends a drink, ring it up, add the $25, give her change, and wave the bad check at her. She goes ballistic. She storms out yelling, I'll be back to get my money. But she didn't come back, and her friends left. At 10 p.m., the bar is full and she storms in with Bruce. Bruce is carrying a large laundry bag. Before I can stop her, she is at the cash register. I grab her before she can open it and run her out the open end of the bar. Sitting there was a regular couple, Lucy and Pablo, a Puerto Rican guy who liked to say he was tough. Lee shouts to Bruce, who takes a sawn-off shotgun from the bag and places the barrels on the bar between Lucy and Pablo. It was close enough to Pablo that he could have grabbed it and pointed it towards the ceiling. He always acted tough. If I was where he was, that is what I would have done. I'm not sure if it was my training in the LDF as a teenager, but that shotgun would be facing the ceiling. Bruce calls me by name. Stony, give her the money. I said I couldn't. By now, Lee is walking down the bar. My thoughts are to get away from the shotgun, and as I walk down the inside, I keep telling her I can't give her the money. She yells out, Shoot the motherfucker! And every customer who was sitting on a bar stool dives into booths, including my friend Jay from Cary. When Bruce doesn't pull the trigger, Lee yells, Let's go! He puts the shotgun over his shoulder and swaggers out like you would see in a western movie, carrying the laundry bag. Everybody came back to their seats. 
My friend Jay said to me, Your face was white. Why didn't you give her the money? I said, If I gave her the money, I would have to quit my job here since she would be running the bar, and I am not quitting yet. Someone had called the cops, and a sergeant and two cops arrived. I knew two of them well, Callahan the sergeant from the robbery squad, and Bob. Callahan said, You got robbed by two young guys? I said, Listen, Callahan, I was not robbed, and I am making no complaint. Stoney, please, off the record. I would like to hear your version of the events, because at 9.30 p.m., two young blacks with a laundry bag and a sawn-off shotgun stuck up the liquor store on Broadway and 108th Street. Now I knew why Lee had not come back right away when she went to get Bruce. He was out with Jason doing a robbery. Being friendly with Bruce may have saved me. Callahan tells me that he and two cops will do a stakeout across the street from the LaSalle, but their shift ends at 2 a.m. So the first night, they park across the street, and at 2 a.m., Callahan comes over and says they're leaving. He tells me to close my doors. I say, Callahan, you must be kidding. Lee probably knows you guys are parked across the street. She can get me anytime she wants. They do this for three weeks. Same routine. What a waste of manpower. One night it was raining and I see Jason at 1 a.m. with his two hands up against the bar window looking in at me. At 2 a.m., Callahan and the two cops come to me to say they are leaving. It's amazing, the balls of some guys, says Callahan. This little black guy was banging on the police car window asking us if we would go get him a pack of cigarettes from the bar since the bartender didn't like him. We told him to fuck off. We were not going to get out in the rain. I started to laugh. I said... Callahan, that was one of your stick-up men. A few nights later, the cop I did not know so well stopped in to say that Callahan had a plan. If I went to the front entrance of the building and pushed Lee's intercom and called her every bad name to piss her off, she would get her two boys and come down to get me, and then they would move in. I said no, that Lee will know I got somebody backing me up, and then she will really get me. After that, they said they would be leaving the stakeout for good. I told them they were never any protection for me anyway. At 3.30 a.m., Bob, the cop I knew, came in and said, Stoney, I'm glad you didn't go for Callahan's plan. He's desperate to get an arrest. And I thought Callahan was my friend. Don't get flaked by Popeye Doyle. Every year, the bar would get new customers. Families would have sons, daughters reaching legal age to drink, or some just come in to use the payphone. One college guy, Luke Gallagher, used to come in with his girlfriend. He would talk about his brother, Bill, going to college in Arizona. He said that he was coming home for a few weeks and, you got to meet him. So one night he comes in with a guy on two metal crutches. He says, Stoney, this is my brother Bill. I have a big hello for him. They order drinks. Bill has a Seagram 7 with ginger ale. They stay for an hour before Luke and his girl left. Bill stayed until closing left and got a cab. He told me he lives six blocks away on 96th Street. The next night, he is back and stays until closing. I am thinking it is a sad way to spend your weeks out of college. He did not drink to get drunk. I never asked about his legs, but it looked like polio. When Bill had been coming in for about two weeks, a young black guy named Leroy started coming in to use the phone only. He would say hello, but never ask for a drink. On quiet nights, he would stop and chat for a while, he told me his father was a cop. He looked like he was about 17 years old and had the looks of a young Muhammad Ali. I asked him what he wanted to be when he got older. He said he wanted to own a stable of girls. I say to him, A brothel? He says, Yes, that's where the money is. He told me something else also. Maybe he was trying to scare me. He told me that one night he had a problem with a guy, so he stole his father's gun and stuck it in the guy's mouth. That guy knew where I'm coming from, he says. Now, he said, he got three guys that hang out with him. Sure enough, the following night he walks in to use the phone, has a big hello for me, he has three Puerto Ricans with him. He uses the phone, smiles to me and says, thank you, Stoney. He used to come in three or four times a week on his own or with his buddies. One night at 2 a.m., only two customers are left, Rafferty, with a sleeping disease snoring in a booth, and a young Bill Gallagher at the bar with his crutches. In walks Leroy with a girl. 
He goes right to the phone. I could tell she was very new to this, but he had her under his spell. While the two of them are at the phone, I see him pointing to Bill, telling her to go chat to him. She moves up beside Bill and starts chatting. Bill is thrilled to have a girl beside him and he buys her a drink. Leroy gets off the phone and leaves. Bill is in heaven. She goes to the bathroom and I see my chance. I tell Bill, You're being set up. Please make sure you don't leave with her. Don't worry, Stoney. I am okay. She is so nice. I walk away. There's nothing I can do with a young guy on crutches and a few drinks in him who maybe never had a girl. Leroy comes back, says a few words to her and leaves. She helps Bill with his crutches and off they go. It's 4am now, so I close the door and I put out the lights so I can watch them. They cross the street, then they are talking, and then she hails a taxi. As she gets the back door open, something is said that registers in Bill's brain. He won't get into the taxi. Instead, he starts back across the street, and I see Leroy follow him. I know something is going down, so I run to the booth and pull Rafferty out of his stupor. I run him to the door and I yell, You stand there! I'm thinking that if something happens, having the extra person is important. I look out the window and I see Bill has reached the door. Leroy hits him and down he goes, and so does Leroy. I fly the door open and push Rafferty out and yell, What are you doing?! Leroy is trying to get into Bill's pockets. Leroy spins around with a gun in his hand, saying, Get the fuck out of here! I say, Leroy, are you going to kill all three of us? He walks away. I pick up Bill and his crutches and bring him inside. I sit both of them at the bar and give them a drink. Rafferty hadn't a clue what had just happened. The next night, my friend Jay from Cary is in, and I am telling him about what happened, when in walks Leroy with a big smile and his three buddies. They all walk to the phone. I say to Jay, I can't let them leave without saying something. Otherwise they got me, then I may as well quit. I see Leroy getting off the phone and I walk to the front of the bar by the door. I still don't know what I am going to say. Here he comes with his crew behind him. As he gets to where I am, I say, Leroy. And before I can say another word, he says, What is it, Stoney? I say, I don't want you in here anymore. Then one of his buddies jumps on the footrest of the bar and says, We will come in here any time we want and you won't do a fucking thing about it. I have a genius flash in my head and I stick my face into his and say, You decide to come in here again, I know enough cops in the 24 precincts to flake you guys with enough drugs to put you all away for 20 years. It worked. I never saw them again. At that time, the Knapp Commission was investigating lots of cops. A detective, his nickname was Popeye Doyle, had made 8,000 arrests in his career and his detective partner was put on the stand to testify. He spills the beans and tells how they used to flake people, but no one knew what this meant. He explained they would be driving in an unmarked patrol car and Popeye would see someone he did not like the look of. He always kept drugs in a closed fist, so he would tell him to stop the car. Then he would jump out, run over to the guy and slam him against the wall. Then he would put his hand in the guy's pocket and then pull out his open fist and say, See what have I got here? A lot of innocent people were wronged. At the time, it was all over the papers. A famous movie was made about it, The French Connection. It was a big hit, with the actor Gene Hackman as Popeye Doyle. It is nice to know that 90% of cops, given the opportunity, want to be decent and do the right thing. But you still have a percentage of Popeye Doyles. I knew cops who carried an extra gun. They explained to me that when they stopped someone who had a gun, they would take it from him and tell him to fuck off and keep the gun. If they shot someone who did not have a gun, they would plant the spare gun and claim he had a gun. Law Enforcement The LaSalle was a tough bar to work in for the eight years I was there. There were a lot of disputes. I took five guns and fourteen knives off guys, and I gave them all to cops. The next night, when these guys would ask for them back, I would tell them that I gave them to the cops. I got away with saying that because a lot of cops from the 20th, 24th, and 26th precincts hung out there, until the Knapp Commission was set up. After the Knapp Commission got rolling, cops couldn't drink in the precinct where they worked, but the cops from the 20th and 26th precincts still came in occasionally after work. 
Flaherty told me how to handle a situation if a sergeant comes in and cops from the local precinct are in the bar. He said to say, Hi, Sarge. I was having trouble with a customer and I saw the police car and I ran out to ask the cops for help and they put him out. About a month went by and two cops I knew came in in uniform. I was surprised, but I liked them, so I give them a drink. They tell me they have a new sergeant, transferred from the 108th Precinct in Long Island City, Queens. I'm looking towards the door and I see this uniformed cop walking in. I grab the drinks and throw them down the sink so there's nothing on the bar. It was their new sergeant, and, to my surprise, he was from my home place in Ireland, Dowra. I pretend not to recognize him, but I see the stripes. I say, Sergeant, I had a troublemaker, and I ran out into the street, and I was lucky those two cops were driving by. They came in and got him to leave. He puts his hand up at me. Okay, I heard you. They talk and leave. At 1 a.m., the same sergeant, Bob McGovern, comes back in civilian clothes. We have a big hello for each other and talk about Daura, etc. Then he says, Stoney, don't go out of your way to protect cops. I stop him right there. I was not fibbing to you when I told you about the patrol car. He says, Okay. The next night I tell Flaherty about how he came back. He was checking you out, says Flaherty. If you told him the truth, he could never trust you. You did a good job. I was very strong, and I had a great technique for putting a guy out. I would come out from behind the bar and start talking to the guy who was giving me the most trouble. After I got him calmed down, he would drop his arms. I would make like I was walking away, but I'd walk around the back of him. With his hands still down, I'd throw my hands around him from behind, lock my fingers, and fly out the door backwards, all the way to the street, and drop him fast. I would run through his pockets, pull out the knife or gun, and run in shouting, Call the cops! Call the cops! After that, I'd lock the door and he would run away. I had a few scary incidents, but first I'll talk about some of the characters. There were quite a few Irish and Irish Americans in the neighborhood. There were Jackie Sullivan, McMorrow, Frank Lynch, Donnie Treller, and McRory. All those guys went to school together. Jackie Sullivan, known as Sully, worked for the Port Authority, went on drugs, but held on to his job. He lived with his father, who was an alcoholic. They slept in the same bed, but they didn't get along, so they never talked. Sully would get up in the morning and go to work. The father would be on the other side of the bed asleep. After work, Sully would stay out drinking and more until all hours. The father would be in the bed when he got back. Sully woke up on a Sunday morning and decided to make coffee. While he was waiting for the water to boil, he realized that there's a terrible smell. He checked the bed, and the smell is the father. He called the cops and the ambulance. They took the body out. The next day, the cops come to talk to him. They told him he had been sleeping with a corpse for three nights. It didn't seem to bother him, though. After his father died, he would come into the LaSalle in the mornings. Jack, my boss, had known his father very well. He didn't like the idea of Sully sleeping with a corpse. One time, Sully is talking and Jack is answering, sometimes with a question. Finally, Sully leaves. Jack says, Stoney, in this business you can handle piss, you can handle shit, you can handle corruption, but you can't handle piss, shit, and corruption. And that's what just walked out that door. About a year later, Sully hooked up with an old school buddy, Emmett Conlon, who taught at Columbia University but was on heavy drugs. He had joined AA, and he asked Sully to come with him. He did. They both quit drinking and smoking. Emmett went to California to become successful building houses. Sully saved his money, bought a house in Breezy Point, off the Rockaways, and lived there, enjoying the ocean. Back when Sully was on whatever he was on, they would all go skiing on Hunter Mountain. Wherever they were going, they asked me to go with them, and I did. My boss didn't like it. One night, Paul McMorrow and I were standing in the middle of the floor. After the music stopped, Sully came running up, looked Paul straight in the eyes, and said, I know everything. Ask me anything. Anything. Come on, anything. Paul says, Who's the first president of the United States? Sully closes his eyes, shakes his head, opens his eyes, looks straight at Paul, and says, Ask me another one. Those damn drugs. Paul became a building inspector. 
He said building owners would give him cigars wrapped in $50 bills. McRory always called him a genius, and I reckon he was. But he was also a bully. There was a building super, George and his wife Patricia. They lived on Riverside Drive. Patricia would dance by herself and make jokes. She never bothered anybody. I would leave her in the bar while I was cleaning up. One night there was Nappy, a cop and a very nice man, and Paul and Patricia dancing in her own little world. Paul and Nappy were sitting in the middle of the bar. Patricia danced over to them and said to Paul, laughing, Would you like to dance? He spun around and, with his knee bent, he caught her in the stomach with his shoe and then flung her with all the power he could exert. She went flying backwards twenty feet and hit the wall. Down she goes and doesn't move. He yells, Stay away from me, you dirty, rotten scumbag! I went and picked her up and put her in a booth. She didn't move for a long time. Then I gave her a drink. There came a knock on the window. It was Tommy from Cary. He was bartending in McGlade's on Columbus Avenue, one block up. He was double parked outside with the warning lights on. Paul knew him to see, but didn't know him personally, but didn't like him. I opened the door and let him in. Paul says, Why did you open the door for that scumbag? Then continues with, Scumbags like you should stay on Columbus Avenue. Tommy comes right into his face. You take them words back. Paul says, I'll do better than that. I'll shove them down your fucking throat. And he jumps up. They went at it, stools falling everywhere. I'm putting all the stools up on the bar to give them room. Nappy and I look at each other, and I could tell from the look on Nappy's face that we both wanted the carryman to win this one. It went on seven to ten minutes. Finally, the carryman got Paul's legs under his arms and lifted him like a baby and pinned his shoulders and head to the floor. He says, If you don't apologize, I'll snap your neck right now. Paul was barely able to breathe, but he said it. I apologize, I apologize. The carryman said, I don't think you mean it, and leaned harder. I thought his neck was going to snap. Paul says, I mean it, I mean it, and he let him up. Tommy says he's leaving. He goes out and his car won't start. He comes in and asks me if I could give him a boost. His battery is dead. Paul says, I got cables, and tells Tommy he'd be right back. He goes away, gets his car, comes back, and gets Tommy started. They shake hands, and off Tommy goes. I say, Paul, I can't believe you gave up your parking spot to get him started. I respect him. He beat me fair and square. I said, Patricia can't beat you. She won't hurt you, and she may have to go to the hospital. She only asked you to dance. Maybe you can apologize to her. I don't apologize to no low-life bitch. Paul and another school buddy, Tim Bradley, joined the FBI. Bradley had two years of college. He was left in the New York office. Paul had five years, and he was brought down to Washington, D.C., and when his mother passed away, he gave up his apartment on 90th and Columbus. The FBI wanted him to infiltrate the Chinese coke and heroin cartels. They sent him to China for two years to learn Chinese. This was where his genius showed. After he came back from China, he met up with his friend Dan McRory in their favorite restaurant, the Red Blazer. McRory knew the owner, Dennis Carey. McRory was in doubt that Paul could speak Chinese. He asked Dennis if he could bring some of the Chinese porters out of the kitchen to talk to Paul. Sure, says Dennis, but don't hold them up too long. As you can see, it's busy. McRory had two Chinese porters come out and talk to Paul. The two Chinese boys were impressed. Later on, he brought out the chef and the assistant. Later, the chef told McRory, not only does your friend speak Chinese, but he speaks different dialects. McRory is right. He is a genius. Paul went back to Washington for a year and then came back to New York with an FBI friend who lived in Bayside, Queens. They came to the LaSalle. Paul asked me if I had anybody living with me in my house in Flushing. I told him not right now. Paul says, my friend here wants me to stay with him, but he has a wife and kids. I'd prefer to stay with you and get a good night's sleep. I said, I always leave the back door open. All you have to do is walk right in, take the bedroom on the right, and off they go. I close up and get home at 6 a.m. Paul is in bed, but awake. He tells me he had just gone to sleep, but he woke up with two big flashlights shining in his face and somebody asking him, who is he? 
He explained he's FBI and shows them ID. They tell him the next door neighbor called saying there was a prowler next door. We talked for a while, then he goes to bed and I go to my room. I'm almost asleep when I hear noise. I open my eyes and Paul is in my room, opening the dresser drawers. I say, what's wrong, Paul? He says, I'm missing my $3,000. I jump up. I say, where did you have it? In my pocket, he says. Paul, I said, I just came in. How could I have it? He said, the two cops stole it. I'm going to the precinct. I'm going with you. We get to the precinct and he demands and gets into the captain's office. He was Italian. What a cool guy. The captain says, Before we call the IAD and maybe destroy those officers' names, did you look everywhere? So Paul explains, There was nobody in that room but me and the two officers. They took my money. Okay, says the captain. Let's call IAD before the cops come in off their shift. We're sitting there in the 109th precinct, and in walk two women in their fifties, rumpled clothes and granny shoes. They looked like they had just milked cows, and one of them had an Irish accent. I've heard guys say they could spot a cop fifty yards away. Well, those two would fool cops. Paul and I come out in the hallway. Paul says to me, You've got to work tonight. Go home. I say, Paul, you were in my room going through my drawers. You think I took your money. I ain't leaving your sight until this is solved. There was a public phone on the wall. Paul says, I got to call my friend. Let him know the story. He calls his friend and tells him how the cops were in his room last night and stole his $3,000, and he's in the 109th lodging a complaint against the cops, and IAD is here to interrogate them when they come in off their shift. Maybe it was good Paul went the whole nine yards telling his friend, because his friend says, I've got your money. How? says Paul. His friend says, I came out of the house and I saw something on the street at the passenger side door and I picked it up. I knew it had to be yours. You were tired, so I thought I'll give it to you tomorrow. Now, Paul has to go back in and tell IAD and the captain how he found his money. Paul kept saying, You understand where I'm coming from? But the captain says, No, I don't. You were prepared to bring down two good men. Paul was federal narcotics. He was a good federal agent, and he was against all dope. He stayed with me for a few nights after the money incident. Two nephews and one niece of mine stopped by on their way to California, wanted to stay over, sleep on the floor, and smoke dope. They're in the kitchen talking to Paul. They were not smoking yet, and Paul tells them he's a federal narcotics agent. I'm in the living room when James, the oldest nephew, comes running in and says, That guy in the kitchen, he's a federal narcotics agent. I say, Yes. He says, can I smoke a joint in front of him? Why? I say. Oh, he says, I just want to be able to say I smoked dope in front of a federal narcotics agent. You go ahead, I don't think anything will happen. Paul only made a comment that it shouldn't be done, but he did care. Then again, back in the La Salle, Patricia should not have been kicked either, and I cared. His friend Tim Bradley stayed in the New York FBI office for a year or two. He was told to study, and he did. But in the meantime, one of his jobs was going to doctor's offices with an older FBI agent, checking up on how the doctors distributed pills and how they kept their books. They were doing this for a month when they went into a doctor's office on Fifth Avenue and asked to look at his books. The doctor tells them he has an assistant, Mr. Flannery, who does all his books, so they go in the back and explain who they are. They need to see the books. Flannery gets very nervous and tells them he keeps them at home. They say, fine, they'll give him two days to get all the books and records. See you in two days. After they leave, Bradley's partner says, I don't like what I see. That guy Flannery is too nervous. We'll call the office and give them the lowdown, see if we can get a surveillance on his apartment. They were told to watch the apartment for 24 hours. That evening, Flannery packed up and took a cab to the airport. They approached him as he bought his ticket. They brought him to the FBI office, interrogated him, and he broke. He tells the FBI that he had been a priest for ten years, that he is gay, and his roommate and lover was another priest, Father Cook. Cook was in love with him, and still is. He wrote him very intimate letters, which he kept in a strong box. Cook went his way, and Flannery went his. 
He got a new apartment and a new roommate and a new job in the doctor's office. Years went by and Cook became the cardinal of New York, the richest Catholic diocese in the United States. Flannery said his new roommate was an Italian named Joey, claimed he was tied to the mob. While he was at work, Joey broke into his strongbox, found the letters and stole them. Then he came to Flannery and told him to give him all the drugs he wanted and he wouldn't go to the press. And that's how that all started. They leave Flannery in the room and they go to their bosses. They get scared. Cook is a homosexual. Holy shit! We'd better call Washington. The boys in Washington tell Hoover. Every law enforcement agency in the country was scared of J. Edgar Hoover. But it was a known fact he was a crossdresser, and back then, careers were lost on silly stuff like that. Hoover gives the order. Find Joey. Get the letters. Kill him if you have to. Flannery lost his job and disappeared. No jail time. What interested me about all of this was Bradley's reaction. Here is a guy who, with his parents' consent, joined the Air Force very young, flew million-dollar planes in Vietnam, came back wounded to the state of Utah, and, with three more buddies on crutches, got refused a beer because they were not 21 years of age. But he was so happy the way the Flannery case turned out. My poor mother, he says. If she ever thought there were gays in the Catholic Church, she would have a heart attack. I don't know how long she lived, but she could have learned a lot about the Catholic Church.